this room you have chosen me love has called my name i've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins i'm no longer a slave to fear i am a child of god i'm no
Well, good morning, Redemption Hill Church. How's everybody doing today? It's good to see you. Glad to have you here. And for those joining online, so glad to have you worshiping with us this morning. Look, if you are a first-time guest here, uh, either present or online, we would like for you to do one thing for us. You can fill out a Connect card by texting RHC Connect to 97000. You'll, uh, a card will, uh, will come up. Fill that out. Also, if you have a prayer request, you can do that same thing. Text RHC Connect to 97000. Fill out a prayer request. We'll be sure to be praying for you throughout the uh, entirety of the week. Next weekend is Labor Day weekend. Normally at Redemption Hill, we'd be doing a big blast at a uh, local park. But with the uh, current pandemic and going on, what we're doing is we're pivoting that to small groups. So each small group has a little bit of a different twist on what they're doing for Labor Day. If you want to find out what's going on with the small groups, go to our website. You can uh, uh, click on the different small groups there and uh, call your small group leader and uh, check out what's happening. This is a great time. If you're not part of a small group, this would be a great time to get engaged and get to know people and, uh, and begin to uh, fellowship and stuff like that. All these activities will be outdoors and, uh, and, and it will be safe and it will be a lot of fun. Now, we're getting ready to do something that we love to do at Redemption Hill, and that is celebrating people's lives being changed by the resurrected power of Jesus Christ. So we're celebrating a baptism this morning. So why don't we go ahead, give God a hand clap for that. Amen. 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 Tell us what we got going on. Amen. Come on in, Samir. This is Samir Sanders Church family, and uh, go ahead and have a seat. <clears throat> um, just over the last, no, sorry, you guys stand up. He's going to sit down. <laughs> You guys stand up. So that's confusing. I'm sorry. Slide, slide down this way for me. Now, you guys don't slide. Now, I know y'all are trying to follow directions. Uh, several months ago, Samir came and said that he desired to be baptized. And, uh, man, we were just so excited to see how God is changing lives, how God is using his uh, children for his glory. And so we celebrate here at Redemption Hill Church. If you have never been a part of a baptism here, we celebrate it like your favorite team just scored a touchdown or a goal or whatever it is that you like to cheer the loudest. Uh, and so his brother's going to come. Quarte's going to come and help. And I told Quarte, don't hold him down too long, okay? <laughs> but we are just so excited to see what the Lord does through uh, this young man. So Samir, have you accepted Jesus and desire to follow him in believer's baptism? Yes. Then I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go ahead and hold your nose. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Great job. Great job. Amen. Amen. Well, Father, we, Father, we do just praise you. We praise you for the work that you are doing in uh, the lives of people around us. God, we pray that you would use us for your glory. Lord, that we would just see men and women, boys and girls, come to faith in Jesus Christ, and that they would profess that in believer's baptism. And God, we just pray that this would be a reminder to each of us that if we are in you, we are a new creation, that the old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. And God, if there's one among us that does not know you, that they would see this as a symbol of the new life that is available in Christ, and that if anyone here does, has not been baptized, that they would uh, come and talk to us about that. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Yes. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Man, uh, I had to, to say a quick prayer before I got up here because that Samir's yes <laughs> got me. Man, isn't there just something about someone professing the name of Jesus that yeah. just hits at the yeah. soul, the core level? Um, man, I'm just so grateful for the gospel truth. I'm so grateful for my salvation. It causes me to reflect, uh, to desire, to, to call out the name of Christ and profess his name as the only one who saves as the only one who gives us the identity and, and, and salvation and life and community and freedom that we were created to have. And we're going to celebrate that in his word this morning. So take your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 11. 
We're finishing up Acts chapter 11 this week as we march through uh, the book of Acts together. And we're going to look at verses 19 through 30. And, and I'm going to pray to not only bless, ask God to bless our time in his word, but also to, to, to collect myself. God, thank you so much uh, for your word and your truth. And, and God, I'm so thankful for, for the fact that you are living and active and you are unchanging. And the word that we read and what we see of you, and how you work, and what you do, and how your spirit works in power through your people is the same thing that you do today, is the same way that you work today. And God, you are still saving, and you're still moving. Yes. And God, your people are still multiplying. And God, we're so thankful for that. And I pray that each of us who know you in this moment would just take a moment to reflect on the fact that you have saved us and what that means and to be thankful. And God, for those of us who may not know you in this room this morning, I pray that today would be the day of our salvation, that you would reveal yourself in a life-changing way and that we would place our faith in you, the reality that you have done all of the work for us to have salvation by your grace. And you are the only king that does that. You're the only God who does that. You're the only one who saves and allows us to walk in who you have made us to be and not to walk to become something. And so, God, we we are thankful for your word. I pray that you would speak to us through your word. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, If you remember, as we've been walking through the book of Acts, uh, at this point, we've seen that, that God, he came down to earth. And, 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 and this never gets lost on me, that the God who created everything, who's sovereign and all-powerful over all things, who's in control of every single moment, of every single day, and every single situation in our lives, he came down to earth. And he, Jesus, taught us as he walked with us who he was He proclaimed to be God, our Savior. He told us that he fulfilled all of the prophets of the Old Testament, that he was the one who came to restore what had been lost as we walked away from him in our sin and rebellion and lost the community that we were created to have. But our God came and lived and walked the earth and did what only he could do. And he fulfilled every promise that a Messiah would come and that salvation would be given. And in so doing, he brings about a new kind of kingdom where everything that is broken and everything that we desire and everything that we long for is being brought to fruition. It is coming true. It's being redeemed. That everything is being restored. And as I said, he's a new kind of king. He's the only king that comes to serve and doesn't require that we serve to perhaps become what the king has demanded we become. But he comes and fulfills all that the king demands so that we might be brought into his kingdom and that our own hearts and lives might be restored as we see his restoration of the kingdom all around us. And he brings us into a new people, a people of his grace, a people of his mercy, a people satisfied and made whole in him. And he did so by dying on a cross for the sins of all who believe. And as only a God man could do, perfect and sinless in our place. And then he rose from the dead, appearing to many who were still alive as scripture was being written. And the church began and it grew. And the church still, even to this day, remains the fastest growing movement and longest lasting movement in human history. And it's all based on his death and the fact that he rose from the dead and that those who saw him believed. And they shared all that Christ had done in this new kingdom with this new king and this new people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. As we've been talking about over the last several weeks, that restoration comes to not only the soul but to humanity. And he creates everything and brings us back into everything that we were created to have in him. This movement is so incredible and it was all based on the resurrection. And certainly, listen, there's, we don't have time to dig deep in here, but there's no explanation capable of explaining why a misunderstood teacher would be crucified in a shameful way with only a few disciples would change the world within months of dying in the city in which he was killed by the people who killed him for calling himself God, placing their faith in the reality that he was the God who he proclaimed to be. 
because they saw him risen from the grave. I agree with Tim Keller when he said, if you do not believe in the resurrection, then the burden is on you to come up with something just as miraculous to explain the church in the first century. But we know that after he rose, the church exploded. Why? Because he said, I will not leave you alone, but I will send the power of the Holy Spirit to live and dwell in you. That I'll be with you, that I will, that I will give you the power to live in me and to experience the freedom uh, of all that I have planned for you to walk in and to know and for you to have the power to proclaim and reveal all that I am, that many people might come to know me. And we read about that in Acts chapter 1.8. That he'll send power of the Holy Spirit, that we might be his witnesses to all people. And that's really the table of contents to the rest of the book of Acts. Fulfilling the great commission in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2 on the, on the Israelite people, and then he falls on the Samaritans. We've seen over the last several weeks, he, he comes in the same way to the Gentiles to reveal that there is no, no secondary Christians, there's no second-class Christians, that all people are saved in me, created by me, in my image, and that I am building a new people of every nation, tribe, and tongue. And we see the Spirit do that. Within the first six months, scholars tell us, in Jerusalem alone, there were 100,000 believers. Within the first century, we have over a half a million believers. To just a few hundred years later, 53% of the Roman population. And, and hear me, he is still the same God today. Yes. And, and, and I know that all of the book of Acts that we read, it's not prescriptive. Some of it's just describing the things that God did, but I want us to know that he's still the same God, that he still has the same purpose and the same joy in him and the same kingdom that he is building and God is still living and active, and his plan has not changed. His calling on his people has not changed. His church and what he has called us to do has not changed. And, and that should stir our souls. It, it should make our hearts just challenged, our minds challenged with, with excitement and with expectation. If we would devote ourselves to what God has called us to. And, and I don't know, I don't see on your faces there, that there's an excitement in you that it stirs your soul, that the gospel truth is reality and that God is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. All right, a couple of you are with me. For the rest of you, you need to really pay attention. God's power is still living and active. And I know that some of us are unbelievers and we've got questions and this is a perfect text for you. I know some of us are believers and we want to grow and we want to understand God more. And this is a perfect text for us because it reveals to us what a Christian actually is and what discipleship actually is and how we are to be disciples who make disciples. And we see it here in this text, even the word Christian, its origin through the church in Antioch, this, this Gentile church that was planted that, listen to me, all of us can trace our church heritage back to, unless you're a Messianic Jew. If you're a Messianic Jew, and that means you're Jewish by birth, but Christ has radically transformed and saved you, if that's you, then you can trace your church family back to the church in Jerusalem. But for the rest of us, this is where we chase our church family back to. So let's read this together, this, this beautiful text. There's so many truths in here, and we're going to try to focus on the things I believe God wants us to see. Look at chapter 11, verse 19. Now those who are scattered... And that, that might ring a bell to you, and we're going to go back to that in just a moment. Because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. So see, there are a lot of people who scattered under persecution, and they were only sharing their faith with people like them. And that is the easiest thing to do. And I think a big reason of that was they thought these people, I know how to communicate with them. I know how to understand them. I know what they'll respond to. And, and, and they're the, maybe the closest to placing their faith in Christ. So I'm going to share with them. But, but there's a big problem with that because that's not what God had called his people to. But many of them just shared with the Jews. But verse 20, there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists. These are the Greeks. Also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was upon them. And a great number believed and returned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. All right, so that could be a big problem. 
I think they have a kind of a, a, a double-minded reason for why they do what they're about to do, but it ends up being the sovereign God's hand who is on it because the hand of God was on what was happening in Antioch. And it says, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came, he saw the grace of God and he was glad. And he exhorted them with all to remain in the faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them was named Agabus. And this is actually something that was pretty common. These are itinerant preachers, so they're traveling preachers. They go along, and sometimes God would give them a word to profess, and it would be a way of revealing who God is, just as he did through the apostles. And you can read about these itinerant preachers in the Jewish history, the Didache. And so it was pretty common for them to do this. And so Agabus comes and he stood and foretold of the spirit that a great famine would come over the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. Now these people were their enemies just a little bit ago. And now the gospel is radically transforming their heart. And suddenly they can't help but reveal all that Christ has done in them. That they are completely satisfied and whole in who they are in Christ. And therefore they are free to give all that they have for the revealing of his truth to their brothers. And even their enemies will be blessed by them. And they did so sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So here's what I want us to see first. Go back to verse 19. Because when you look at verse 19, you're going to see something that looks very familiar. All right, the last couple of chapters, we've taken a detour from kind of the story that's happening in a line. And we, and we got this detour telling us about Peter and Cornelius and the gospel going to the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit falling on the Gentile people. That God is making for himself one church with one people from every nation. That he brings us together, not based on who we are and where we are from, but on who he is and what he has done. And by grace, we are saved. And that humbles us to find our value and purpose in him and what we were created to be in him. And as he works through us, we love all people created in his image. And all people created in his image become brothers and sisters in Christ. There's now no separation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no Jew or Gentile, but we are all in him. And and so we saw that, but then going back to, if you remember in chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, just after Stephen was killed for his faith and Saul oversaw that, and in chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, the people scattered under the persecution of Saul. And so God sends them out. All right, so many of them were only um, sharing their faith with the Jewish people. Many of them were just huddling in Jerusalem and Judea. They, did, they weren't traveling out. They weren't doing what God had called them to do. And he allows persecution to come in to scatter them. And now they're scattered all over. And when the people were scattered, contrary to what we might think, that when persecution comes, the belief or the faith weakens, it was actually empowered, and they take the gospel out to wherever they are scattered, and many people began to come to faith. Many churches began to be planted. And it's crazy because this is actually the pattern of history, that when persecution comes, it actually has the opposite effect of what the persecution desired. We see it all throughout history. Every attempt uh, that happens, and it's happened quite often, to belittle or discredit Jesus or belittle the word of Jesus. And, and it always serves to push the church and the people of God deeper and further into the knowledge of God. And in the knowledge of God, we reveal who we are in him and his salvation, and the church grows. See, explosion of the church in Antioch was happening during persecution. The church was growing in such a powerful way during persecution of the faith. And we see this all throughout the Old Testament as well as history. We could start at the very beginning, but just to start with Jesus, Satan thought that he had won when Jesus died, but what happens? Jesus rises from the grave, and in him we have new life, and he represents the new life that we have in him, the new king, the new kingdom, the new people. We try, he tried to kill uh, the church through Saul and persecution. But what happens? God saves Saul. 
And he's going to send Saul out to be a missionary to many places all throughout Rome and to the Gentiles. The church scatters very soon in the church's history. And you might think to yourself, "Uh uh-oh, the church is is kind of, they need to kind of huddle together in in Judea. They need to get strong before they can go out. They need all of these different things and the budgets and the people and all these plans and all these strategies and all these things. So certainly when they scatter this early on, everything is going to come to a quick end. But it actually serves to be the opposite. And churches are planted all over the world. See, the church... Is, is something that, that God uses and, and uses whatever we go through and whatever circumstance we are in to reveal who he is through his people. And oftentimes that happens through persecution. And, and I want us to be encouraged here because I think that God is getting ready in our setting and in our culture to do something big again through the persecution of the believers. And I want us to be encouraged here because people, people tend to think, as I said, that when persecution comes, faith will weaken. But it's contrary to everything we see through Scripture and history. As persecution has taken place, Christians have not stopped believing, but they have actually become firmer in their faith. And when they have been willing to suffer and even die for their faith, it has been the, the, the seed, so to speak. There's a saying that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It's true throughout history that the seed, so to speak, of the suffering believer reveals that Christ is greater than anything that we could have on planet earth. That he's greater than health and wealth and, and his name is greater than any name that we can make for ourselves. And his kingdom is greater than any kingdom we can make for ourselves. And his people are better than any people that we could call ourselves a part of on this planet earth. And when this happens throughout history, people deepen in their faith. And the opposite of what we might think actually occurs. And then what we actually find is the opposite in reality. That when ease and comfort are where we find ourselves as believers, we often become comfortable and lazy in the things of Christ. And historically, more people walk away from the faith in times of comfort with a lack of understanding of who they actually are in God and his word than those who are persecuted for what they know and stand firm in in God and his word. So we see the opposite of what we might think. Because listen, all of us, we have a tendency to believe and lean into most what we know best. And, and I just want, I, I want to say this to us, and I want us to take this in and think about our own lives and this reality. When we know the culture best and not the word of God best. When culture speaks into us and not the word of God most. When we participate in culture most, when we are entertained by culture for our satisfaction, when we find rest in the culture for our comfort, comfort, when we escape in the culture for our peace, then listen to me, you will be convinced whatever the culture says is best for you. You will believe it wholeheartedly and you will tend to walk away from God when his word is questioned. And listen to me, we see that in our culture today. A recent Gallup poll just came out saying that only 35% of those who profess to be followers of Christ actually believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Why? We don't know it. And we're not being spoken into by it. We want less of it, not more of it. And we want more of culture, not more of Christ. And it, and it, and it just radically devastates us. But when we know the word and we find our identity and value in Christ and who we are in him and all that he has done, we will cement ourselves in the truth. And listen to me, no amount of counterfeit gods will be able to come creeping into your life and cause you to sway away from the one true God who has saved your soul. Who gives you the the life and the identity and freedom that you were created to have and can only have in him. So all throughout history, as Christ suffered for our salvation, his people have suffered to reveal his salvation. And it seems to be the thing that just reveals to the rest of the world in the darkest of times and the hardest of places that God is the one thing and his name and his kingdom and his people are the one place that we find life. And and I just want to challenge us this morning to, to understand that anything else we find life in other than God and his word is infinitely more boring than everything that God has called us to, whether it costs us everything or not. It's what we were created to know and have. And so I just want to challenge you to get in the word of God, understand God's word. 
Whatever speaks into you the most will be the filter in which you, you think and you move and you breathe and you believe. And if it isn't the word of God, do not be surprised when, when culture comes up against the word of God and you go on its side and not God's. And a day is coming when that decision will come and you will either be poured into by the word of God and then live it out or you have been being poured into by everything else around you and you will follow a counterfeit God who cannot give you what you long for in the end. See, the word of God is infinitely important. So the people scatter in the persecution and God uses it. And the gospel goes out. And here God does a work in some people who scatter to Antioch, a Gentile city. A city of full of people that aren't like them. And they certainly could have found Jewish people like them. They could have created a little Jewish corner. They could have built a building and just thought, well, if people want Jesus, they'll come to me. They could have done all of those things, but they're committed to God, and therefore they're committed to his mission. They have the heart of God for the people that God has a heart for. And he has called them, and they know, to, to take the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit in them to all people. And so amidst of a city that's pulling them in a thousand different directions to worship a thousand different gods, they reveal the one true God. And in verse 20, Though most who scattered were just sharing, as we said, with those who were like them, there were, and I love this, some of them. So we've got this whole book about like Saul and turning into Paul and Peter, and we see Barnabas in a minute, and Barnabas is just going to come along and kind of clean up a little bit. Like he's just going to give some organization and some discipleship methods, and we're going to see what it looks like to be a disciple through the Holy Spirit working through Barnabas. But some of them are the ones who launched arguably the greatest church in history that becomes a launching pad for all other churches that we know of and a mission launching pad to the rest of the world. Paul's actually going to get his training, we're going to see, and we just read, in Antioch as he preaches to the people, many people coming to faith for a whole year. And then God sends him out. And God's going to use Barnabas for that as well. But just some of them start this church. And some of that might be because if there was any place that you thought would become a launching pad for missions and church planting, it is not Antioch. Like you would look at Antioch and think there is no way that God would do anything there. Too far gone. Let's not waste our time. Let's not go to that place. But God scattered them and probably knowing that and some of them land in Antioch. Some of them with a heart of God and a heart for his mission. And Antioch at the time, it's, it's now southeast Turkey, um, and you can just see the ruins today, but it was the third largest city in the Greco-Roman world in the time. You had Rome, you had Alexandria, and then you had Antioch. The, the lowest amount of people that is believed to be there during this time are 500,000. Uh, some say, suggest up to a million. So this huge commercial city, they had a port. Architecturally, it was beautiful. They actually designed all of their streets in this, this specific grid to allow the, the afternoon breeze to come in to every street so that as you would walk, you would feel maximum amount of breeze. I mean, it's this beautiful city, and, and it's large, and they've got everything that you could imagine. All the Roman roads intersected there, so people are traveling in. The port is there. Everybody from all over the world is coming. There's tons happening, and it's a beautiful city for the gospel to take root and plant out of because it was unbelievably diverse. They had a big population of, listen to this, Greeks, Romans, Syrians, Africans, Phoenicians, Arabs, Jews, Asians, Egyptians, and Indians. Listen to me, this is one of the reasons that cities are so important. Because God has called us to take the gospel to the nations, baptizing all people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He empowers us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And, and here in Antioch and here in America, he's brought the nations to us. Yeah. And his cities. And we need to intentionally live out where God has put us because God has brought all people to us. And some of you have people from all over the world who you work with or live right next to you that eventually will go back to where they are from. And they can and have the opportunity as God works in and through you to go back as missionaries to the people without you ever leaving your home or your office. See, cities are important. This is why we care about the city so much. We want to saturate the city with the gospel and plant churches and have small groups all over the city because God has brought the nations to us. And listen, there's a reason that scripture goes from a garden to a city. 
Because God is in the process of bringing the nations to himself. And in America, we have cities where people from all over the world gather. And we have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. And listen to me, another thing that a city does is it makes us live out the gospel truth. Because in a rural area, you can love one another and you can do those things. But if you live in the city, then there are problems you cannot ignore. And God uses that for us as a church family to say, we either put up or shut up. And we got to get our feet in what God is doing and walk through this city and, and bring the gospel truth and redemption to reveal his kingdom that he is producing where we live and where we work and where we play. So cities are extremely important. Antioch is an extremely important city. It's just like the United States today. People from all over the world, cultures from all over the world, religions from all over the world. It's the capital of diversity. And therefore, it's also the capital of God's worship. Just like we are today. Now, we worship different types of gods and different things. They had statues, temples, all kinds of stuff. It's, it's actually said that in the city of Antioch during the first century, there was as many gods as men. But in America, we have the same. We may not realize what even we are worshiping or whatever we call a God, but they are the things that we draw life out of and identity out of and value out of. And there are a million different things that probably hundreds that each of us struggle with worshiping and they're counterfeit gods that will not give us what we need and what only God can do. But we find ourselves in the same place. So yeah, so many gods in the city and during the Pax Romano where there was peace everywhere, they could travel and people could come and worship from all over the place, similar again to America. People were also very well educated. Cicero actually wrote that the city is the most learned of men in liberal studies. And all of these people seeking knowledge, it was also a very broken place. One of the major temples in the city was the, the temple of Daphne, and the priestesses there were actually prostitutes, and the form of worship was to go and have sex. That was worship. And it was one of the most popular temples in the city. These are people who are searching. These are people who are broken. These are people who are lost, and they're grasping at everything that they possibly can to find some sort of answers. Even Rome itself thought Antioch was immoral. They're just trying everything. As Rome became more like it, a first century historian said, the morals of Antioch have reached our city. So this is a city that is defining new morality. They're, they're stretching boundaries on traditional things that have been believed in culture, and it is affecting all of the cultures around them. And this is the city that the believers are first called Christians, and this is the city that the church launches in that would affect all other churches. Because it was a really good place for the gospel to grow. And listen to me, uh, our, our culture today is a really good place, contrary to maybe what we think, for the gospel to grow. Because people who have everything always find that they have nothing of ultimate value. And in the greatest darkness, the truth and light of the gospel put on display is very easily seen. And this is what the men do, and many people come to faith. So these men from Cyprus and Cyrene, they become bridge builders between the truth and the lie, the God and the false gospels. And every single one of us, I want us to know this, we are called to be bridge builders in our communities where we live, work, and play between the truth and the lie. It's what God has called us to do. God has placed every single one of us in the position where we are right now to be a bridge. I know we talk about this all the time, so maybe this is a little bit of a different imagery that will help some of us out. Because every single one of us is called to be a bridge. Some of you are called to be a gospel bridge between the truth and the doctors that you work with. Some of us are called to be a gospel bridge between the truth and the teachers that you work with. But every single one of and some of us are really good at getting along with multiple cultures and people groups and all of these different kinds of things. And that's a blessing from God to be a bridge between peoples that we might realize and understand what the gospel actually does. And we aren't just saved and separate, but saved and brought into unity in the gospel truth. See, God has called every single one of us to be a bridge between the truth of God and the lie of the world. Every single one of us. And see... The citywide missional movement that we talk about all the time, I know that that could seem totally overwhelming. 
I get that. But what we see in these men is that changing uh, a city that changes the world simply starts by being intentional where you live, work, and play. And we are reminded of that. God, he says, is the one who does all the work. It was because his hand was on them that all these people began to come to faith. And all they were doing is be intentional where God had them. I need us to see that. I know we talk about it all the time because it's all throughout Scripture. See, these men did not go to Antioch because God had given them some massive missional calling. Like they did not have a dream about Antioch. They did, they, God was not just placing it on their heart until they got up and left. They were not in danger of being swallowed by a well or anything else that we see in Scripture where God has just placed something on somebody's heart and called them so obviously as even in the last couple of chapters he did with Peter to go to Cornelius. See, all that was happening is they were persecuted and they ran. And they got to Antioch and they were like, well, this is as good a place as any. And they began to work and they began to get to know people. And it says that they began to preach the gospel truth. And that word preach there is just the word evangelize. See, all they're doing is sharing the identity that they have and the value that they have in the midst of a thousand different gods who cannot give anyone the value that they long for, that they have a better God. They have a truer king that's bringing about a better kingdom that welcomes us into the people uh, of, of his kingdom for all of eternity. And it's all by grace that we are saved. So all they're doing is, is laying out the reality of Jesus Christ and people are coming to know him. Why? Because they've been reaching for all sorts of other things that have never satisfied. Anything you can imagine. And the people of God just come in and they, they listen and they learn and they engage. And they share who they are in Christ. And I want us to think, is that the way that we live where we are today? Are we engaging with the people around us? Are we revealing the thing that we worship? What do people see as our God when they get to know us? I want us to think about the why that we do everything that we do. Because it'll make a difference in how you live and what you do and what you say and and what you experience in your relationship with God and what God does in and through you. It directly affects your joy in him and your freedom in walking in him. What is the why in which we live? See, God has called every single one of us to be all about his mission. And I want us to see also, because I think when we read the book of Acts, every single one of us at some point, if there's any bit of the spirit in us that's working, like we, we think to ourselves, I want to see this. I want to be a part of this. And I want you to know that God is, is, as I said at the beginning, he's still living and active and moving. And I also want you to understand that he has dispersed you. And see, it might not be under persecution, but he has put us all in this place to worship and to gather and to love and to care and to send out. But then he disperses us into different neighborhoods and different jobs with different people. And he's working in you and all around you. And many people will come to know him if your why is his mission. If your why is his glory. So when you go to work, and I'll just use this as an example, but you can put it into anything else. Your neighborhood, what you do for hobbies. Do you go to work just for a paycheck? I know that's important, but is it just for that or is it for the people that you work with? Do you you go to work and find that to be your value and worth and the job that you are doing is kind of defining who you are or is it just the mission field that God has put you on and you do the best you can to glorify him and to reveal him to others? I, I want us to think about that just for a moment. What is the why in which you do what you do? God wants to use every single one of us where we are. And I love how he he makes that so clear. Look what he does here. As I said, we get all these stories about all these big people throughout scripture. But then again, he says that this missional movement was started by some of them. So we don't even know who they are. They're just farmers, maybe doctors, Antioch text. Like we have no idea. We have no idea what they're doing. They're just men and women who are radically transformed by the gospel to live intentionally where God has put them in the midst of persecution. And they've scattered to this place and they land there and they go, we have a better God and we need to reveal him because he has called us to do so and his power is working in and through us. And we all need to know that movements do not happen with million dollar budgets. 
and plans and man strategies and, and funny preachers and, and amazing bands. All I can do from up here is fan what God is doing in you. But a missional movement happens when the people of God become missional in everything that they do. Everywhere that God has dispersed them. Everywhere that God is taking them and all that God is doing. And we'll see in a second just how God has called us to do that. But we cannot confuse popularity with significance in God's plan. The plan of God is for all people and all of us to be a part of this unending movement that he has. And it will not go the way that we even desire it to because of what God is doing in our heart if we are not all involved. The power of the church to see see a city come to faith and for disciples to be multiplied and the gospel to be saturated amongst all people and for lostness to be decreased is every believer being on mission in the daily rhythms of their daily lives where God has put them. To be intentionally devoted to the things of God, to know him more than anything else that speaks into your life. Because every single day, there are a hundred different things that are trying to tell you a gospel contrary to what will actually satisfy you. Be intentionally devoted to God. Be intentionally engaged with the people that speak the truth into you and disciple you and walk with you. Intentionally generous with all that God has given you to reveal him and all that you do. And be on his mission intentionally. And that's critical These, some of them, shared the gospel with their friends and their neighbors, and all these people come to faith. And God will spread his gospel truth in exactly the same way today, and I believe it's actually what he's calling us to do. And for some reason, we put these church buildings up, and we see them more as a gathering place for the people of God to come together and worship together and encourage one another and train one another in the word of God and be sent out on mission. And somehow this became the mission. Now, if it's a front door, fine. If you're here for the first time because a friend of mine, we're glad you're here. But this isn't what it's all about. This is so you take the truth of God out to the people that God has placed in your life. That we live missionally, that we train one another, but we go out. And I love how they just engage the city. Like, as I said, they could have moved over into the corner and just created a Jewish quarter. They could have even said to themselves, we'll just wait for Peter. Surely God's going to bring Peter here. Like, God will bring somebody else to do the work. They might even pray. Maybe you sit at work and pray that God will bring somebody else into your work to talk to that dude. They might have done that. But what they actually did was honor God in the way that they lived, and they engaged their culture to reveal a better Savior, and God moved. And so much so that so many people were coming to faith that the church in Jerusalem heard about it. I love how the grace of God, like, they just continue the church in Jerusalem. They don't want it but they just continue to be victims of God's grace and it's always better than they ever asked or imagined. And so they hear that all these people are coming and they, they're like, okay, we need to send somebody. And it's probably has a double motive. It's probably like, let's make sure this thing's legit. Maybe it's not, but just in case, send Barnabas because he's probably the right guy for the mission. And Barnabas is gonna give this movement some organization and discipleship. So we'll see him in our last couple of minutes together. Look at verse 23. He got there and he saw the grace of God. This is incredible. He saw God moving. Now, it was totally different than the church in Jerusalem. Like, you got to know this. Everything I just described about Antioch, this is not normal for Barnabas. He's the traditionalist. Like, he's coming from a church where everybody's being saved out of Sunday school and he's entered into a place where everybody's being saved out of prostitution and addiction. This is different. All right, but he gets there and he sees, hey, the mission of God is going for It's different. They have all these different ways of doing this. Like they are going outside the temple of Daphne and they're talking to people who are worshiping in this certain way that we wouldn't even want to get close to in Jerusalem. But God, look what God's doing in it. And see, what's most important to Barnabas and every believer who is a disciple who desires to make disciples and do what God has called them to do is the glory of God and the mission of God and people being discipled. So Barnabas sees that God is on the move, and look, he doesn't get mad about it. His first response is not to pour in there and just go, can't do that. That No, no you cannot do that. And, and this is what you have to do. It's got to look everything like the church in Jerusalem. But he sees that God is moving, and he gets glad. And he exhorts them to keep in the faith with a steadfast purpose. He's like, he's fanning the flame for them. He's like, keep doing it. 
People are coming to faith. You're engaging with people who are lost. Keep going. Keep doing. It's not the way we do it in Jerusalem, but I see God working. I see his grace all around you. I'm glad, and I want to exhort you in that. God's clearly moving, and he gets really excited. And listen to me. We should see where God is moving in our church and see what God is doing in our city and get excited about it. It's one of the reasons I love when we have baptism here and everybody gets really excited. That's the way it's supposed to be. If that doesn't excite our hearts, we need to repent and give our lives to Christ. If he's in you and he's living and he's active, then we get glad about what he's doing because we know that's ultimately all that life is about. So he gets excited and he encourages them, maybe your text says. This is a really hard word to interpret into English, by the way, from the Greek word. There's no one word that we can interpret. So I don't normally give you Greek words. I try to just explain what they are. But this one's really important for us to see. What it says that he does there is parakaleo. And it's really important for us to see. The word para there means that he pairs with. A little, little bit of the obvious. He comes together with. He loves them. He walks with them. He meets them where they are. So you better believe this church, they had a whole lot of things that they need to learn and grow in. These are just some of them who have taken the gospel to where they are. And so Barnabas is coming in. He's going, man, I love what God is doing here. Let me teach you some theology. Let me help you with this. Let's grow together. But he meets them where they are. He's together with them. The second word, kaleo, means to call. And what we see in Barnabas's encouragement is, I'm coming alongside of you and I'm calling you into deeper commitment to God. I'm calling you to be a disciple who makes disciples. I I love you. I I love what God is doing. I love what I'm seeing. I I I see the grace and I just want to fan that flame, but I'm going to call you into a deeper reality. And let me just submit to you, this is the essence of discipleship. This is the soil that the church must have together and that needs to be seen by the rest of the world. That we are a people who love one another and seek truth together. That we encourage and see the grace in people's lives. And we're not discouragers, but we're encouragers. But we're giving courage to people to move forward in truth. So we are truth tellers in love. And see, we will all have a tendency in and of ourselves to be one or the other. We'll be the truth teller that just beats people over the head with truth. That's my tendency. God has graciously worked on me for a long time. Or we'll just be the loving cheerleader. Hey, you're doing, not the way I would do it or I read my Bible, but just keep going. Right? We're just cheering. We're just encouraging. And, And what happens is when we're just cheerleaders, people are never transformed. All we're doing is reinforcing the identity that they're finding in self, and it's actually taking them away from the identity that they need and long for in Christ that only God can give them. We cannot just be encouragers. Now, all of us need encouragement, but we also have to be truth tellers. We have to encourage towards, lead in the truth. But truth must be done in love. If all we're doing is giving the truth and beating people over the head with it, then we will crush them under the religious law. That's not the gospel of grace. They must understand the truth that Christ has fulfilled the law on their behalf and that we are not living in the law of God and the plan and the will of God to become something that we already are not by the work of God for us on our behalf. So we have to be truth tellers as Barnabas comes in. He sees what God is doing. He fans the flame and he leads them into a deeper reality of who God is. This is what we are called to do. And when we do that, Man, the church just ignites. It's the soil that, that makes the soil of the church. It's what makes, the, it's the fertilizer rather, that makes the soil of the church so fertile that, that the gospel just grows in the people of God as we love and encourage. And it's seen by the world outside that this is the family that they desire and long to be a part of. That the people of God are set apart. They are holy as he is holy, but they are loving and gracious as he is loving and gracious. And if all we're doing is telling the truth, we will never be missional. Because all we're going to do is tell people no. And do it this way. But if all we are as as an encourager, we'll never be missional. We'll never do what God has called us to do because we'll never tell people the truth. So we have to be both. And when Barnabas does this, he does it through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
It says that he was a man full of the Holy Spirit, and that's how he does what he does, and that's the only way that we can see truth and love happen in our lives. Otherwise, we will always fall to one or the other. And this is what Jesus says, that this can only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. I love what Jesus says in the upper room in John 16, 7. He's talking to the disciples, and he says to them, he won't leave them alone, but he'll send the Holy Spirit as a helper, as an advocate, This is why the Greek word was so important just a moment ago. The Greek word that he uses there for helper or advocate is the verb form of parakaleo. It's that the Holy Spirit will be a parakalete, that he will come and live and dwell inside of you. He will reveal the truth of Christ to you in everything that you do. He'll constantly point you back to the gospel truth that saved you. And he'll encourage you in all that you are to continue moving forward in him. And so the Holy Spirit in us is in truth and love, constantly encouraging us towards the truth, to stand beside and to call towards Christ. And through the power of the Spirit in us, we begin to see, as Barnabas begins to see this play out in the church, and disciples are made. And it says the church grows even more. Verse 24, so much so that Barnabas can't even lead the thing anymore. And he's like, hey, there's a lot of smart people in this city. I discipled Saul. He's Professor Saul. So I'm going to go find him. He's really smart. He knows a lot. And I'm going to train him up to be sent out here. So he goes and finds Paul. And Paul comes and preaches for a whole year to many people. And the whole movement of God in Antioch was based on his word. As they studied his word, as they learned his word, as they knew of the truth, they lived it out in love through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so many people were coming to faith, they didn't even know what to call people anymore. They were like, this isn't just a Jewish faith, it's not a Roman faith. See, to this point, it was like, this is what the Romans believe, this is what the Jewish people believe, this is what the Greeks believe, this is what they believe, and they believe, and they believe. And now, what do we do with this? God is saving all people to himself from every tribe, language, and tongue, from every nation. People are coming to know Christ. What do we call them? And so they, in a derogatory fashion, call them Christians. They're like Christ. And how fitting that was. As the people from outside of the church saw the people inside the church and they said, you're like Christ. We don't know what to call you anymore, so we're just going to start calling you Christians, little Christ." And they lived this truth out. Look in the last couple of verses together, verses 27 to 30. They lived out the reality of this truth. As Agabus comes and tells them of this thing that's going to happen, this um, famine that's going to occur in Judea, they immediately are just like, all right, the rubber hits the road. Like we love Christ. We are satisfied in him. We have everything that we long for. We know the truth. Now let's reveal the love. And to those who were once their enemies, they give all that they have generously, as much as each could, to reveal the gospel truth to the people in Jerusalem. See, God saves us. We live transformed lives in love and in truth. And we see his grace. And listen to me, this is what every single one of us is called to do. To see where God is working, just like Barnabas did. So when you go to work, you look for where God's grace is moving. You look for the opportunities to pray for something. You look for the doors that God is opening. You, like Barnabas, walk into your workplace, walk into your neighborhood, and you see where the grace of God is. You get glad, and you fan that flame. That's all Barnabas did. He came in and saw the grace of God at work, and he just blew on it, and the thing started igniting, and people started coming to faith, and and they had to to build up the, the infrastructure of the church and begin teaching the Bible so that they would know the truth. And then as the truth fills in them, just love just comes shooting out of them, and they want to bless anybody they can to reveal the love of Christ and the truth that they know. See, I want us to be a people like this. I want us to be a people who see the grace of God working And fan that flame. That God might move powerfully through us. A people of truth that walk forward in the reality of God. And of grace who reveal everything that Christ is in love. God, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you that it is still living and active. And God, I just pray that in this moment... God, that you are speaking to your people and to those who don't know you, that they might become your people. 
God, if anybody doesn't know you right now, I pray that you would draw them unto yourself and that they would place their faith in you and that they would realize that, that you are the king that they've always desired, that your kingdom is the kingdom of redemption that they have always longed for, that your, that your word is, is, is what their ears and hearts have always wanted to hear, and that they would place their faith in you and receive salvation in you. And God, for those of us who know and love you, I pray that the, the truth of who you are would deepen in us. That the, that the gospel truth of you saving us and calling us to, to your mission, that, that in your mission, we would see many people come to know you and we would glorify you and find our joy in your glory. Would not be lost on us, but would deepen in us. God, we love you. We give this time to you. And I pray that you would do a work in each of us in Jesus' name. Amen.
surrounding me let it break and your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every way and your name jesus jesus you make the darkness tremble jesus jesus Silence fear in Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Sing out and breathe. Call these bones to live. Call these lungs to sing once again. And I will praise Jesus, Jesus. tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear oh, Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus sing his name oh Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus Silence me as you do, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name morning church family will you join me in prayer whether you are online or in person this morning would you just please join me in, in going to God in prayer God I thank you so much uh, for who you are and the power that is in your name um, God your name cannot be overcome and uh, it's just such a great truth God that we speak your name um, and you move mightily God 
God, we thank you for our church. Uh, We thank you for Redemption Hill Church. We thank you for the lives that are being changed through this church and the many churches in our city. God, we couldn't do it alone, and so we thank you for other churches in our city. We thank you for Triad Journey Church, God, um, and their pastor as he leads them. God, we pray that you would use them mightily in our city. God, that they would um, just go out and make disciples, God. I thank you for your word um, and that we heard what we heard this morning. Um, God, that we would just go out and we wouldn't just look to the future and make plans for ministry or make plans on how we will make disciples, God, and uh, never do it, but that we would see where you have us now. Um, That we would see our jobs, we would see our families, we would see um, our neighborhoods as opportunities to share your gospel truth and make disciples. God, we love you. Uh, We thank you for all that you are doing and all that you will do. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Redemptional Church, you are sent.